We live in an age of political polarization and preference bubbles, of economic change, rising threats, and a rapidly changing world. Canada needs to stay relevant. We need more smart conversations. We need to dive into critical issues and big ideas with passion and unrestrained optimism. I'm Aaron O'Toole. Welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. Welcome to Blue Skies. I'm very happy today to talk about an issue that is important to my riding of Durham with the Darlington Generating Station. That's important to Canada as really the second country in the world to develop peaceful uses for nuclear fission and an issue that is important to the world if we're actually going to make attaining our climate change objectives possible. How do we reduce emissions while keeping a high quality of life and industrial uh, capacity to our economy to heat the homes in a cold, wintry Canada, uh, we need to rely on nuclear energy as part of our climate future. And today our guest is going to be uh, here to talk about that and the renaissance really that this industry is undergoing in the last number of months and will continue in the next couple of years. James Skoniak is the Chief Development Officer and Executive Vice President of Operational Services at Bruce Power on the Bruce Peninsula. In this role, he's in charge of their growing medical isotope business, their net zero initiatives, power training, business development, and important community and Indigenous stakeholder relationships. Bruce Power, interestingly enough, is the world's largest operating nuclear facility and one of Canada's largest private sector clean energy initiatives, period. It's also one of the most innovative and interesting ownership structures, having a private sector operator of a very important public energy resource that is publicly regulated and has had great success. He's got his MBA from London's Ivy Business School, a master's degree from the University of Guelph, involved in countless community and national charities, a great leader, and that's why he was picked as a top 40 under 40. I'm not sure if he's still under 40, but he certainly keeps the pace of a very young and uh, ambitious person. Welcome to Blue Skies, James. Great. Yeah, you don't get the top 40 under 40 with the gray hair anymore. <laughs> well, you earned it. And look, uh, I've appreciated your leadership, not just on the nuclear sector and at Bruce, but all of your charitable work, and I want to thank you for that. But let's start right off the top. I use that term renaissance, James. You've been in this industry for a number of years, uh, at times trying to really articulate the importance of the sector for uh, to the public and to host communities and to the province. Do you feel that there's kind of a skip in the step for the sector now? There's a little lift under the wings, uh, not just of Bruce, but of you know Darlington and OPG, what's happening with SMRs in, in my writing. Do you feel that this is really a time that Canadians are getting to know the importance of this sector to our economy and to our climate change goals? Yeah, well, firstly, thanks for, for having me, Aaron, for all, and for all your leadership uh, over many, many years of, of our sector. You know, uh, you know I, th I think your question is a good one, and we're, and we're, at, a, we're at a time, I think, right now that it, you could very easily characterize it as a renaissance, but it's really been the, the steady support that we've had over many decades when I don't think we were in that renaissance territory from, from individuals like yourself um, that have really put us in the position that we're in today, and I'm sure we'll be able to talk about that a little bit later. But to answer your question directly, I mean, I think... I think fundamentally the world is 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 starting to realize that we're we're approaching a juncture here where we need to get on beyond just talk and policy papers on climate change and we need to actually look at executable solutions that that are practical that can still protect our economy and can allow us to to move forward. And, and so I, th I think the convergence of, you know, moving away from talk and into a recognition of action, what's really happening from my perspective, Aaron, is that it's really shedding light on, on what's doable and what our solutions are. And, you know, if I, t if I take a step back and, and as an Ontarian and as a Canadian, I'm immensely proud when I, when I look at what we do in our energy sector. And that's not just electricity, it's, it's oil and gas, it's hydroelectric, it's, it's, it's nuclear, it's, it's across the board. But if we're, if we're serious about tackling climate change, the fundamental foundation behind a further decarbonized economy, that doesn't mean we don't have carbon in our economy, it means a further decarbonized economy, 
the core uh, enabler to that is a clean electricity system. Clean electricity that powers our homes, clean electricity that can be used for electrification, whether that's vehicles, other applications. And I think fundamentally, when you strip it all away and you look at the need for reliability, you look at the need for economic competitiveness, and you look at all of the options on the table, there's no serious plan to have reliability, a growing economy, and fight climate change without nuclear power. So I think people are starting to come to the realization that, you know, talk is cheap. We've been talking about this for too long. And when we look at real solutions, and uh, we, we have to put nuclear on the table. And, and so with that, I think there is a renaissance. Because, you know, I always say if policy papers were the, 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 the measuring factor of the fight against climate change, we'd be winning the fight against climate change. <laughs> and we're losing. And so, so to me, I think that's really the driver behind the nuclear renaissance. The results speak for themselves. Yes, I would agree. And it's interesting about talk and reports and, and positive words. Um, one point I made years ago was after the Paris Climate Change Conference. It was new for the Trudeau government. Uh, the Prime Minister and Minister McKenna uh, went there. They actually confirmed Canada's targets that were actually developed under the Harper government that I was a part of. But the new Liberal government kind of reinforced them and talked uh, a really good game that they would price carbon and all that sort of stuff. And Minister McKenna did dozens and dozens of interviews around Paris and never once did she mention this sector. And I used to say uh, to business leaders in Ontario, without nuclear, Ontario would not have been able to come off coal as a source for electricity generation. And to this date, the largest uh, action Canada has taken to reduce our carbon emissions has been Ontario's commitment to eliminate coal. And I'll give credit where credit's due. It was the McGuinty government that committed that. They, uh, it was finally transformed, I think, by the time it was Premier Win. But with, without baseload nuclear energy generated by yourselves at, uh, at Bruce and by OPG, we would still be burning coal. So, you know, how can you have a serious climate change plan without this sector at, at the base of it. And in the last few years, I have now finally seen, I think the first one to mention it was Minister O'Regan. Um, we're now seeing even the, the Trudeau government, which tried to forget this sector at the beginning. Uh, do you see much more wider acceptance uh, politically for, for nuclear now in your experience? Yeah, well, I, I do, and I and I th and I think your you know your example of the phase out of coal in Ontario is a is a good one. If you look at the total amount of energy um, that was required to phase out the use of coal, ninety percent of it came from nuclear. Seventy percent of it came from the Bruce Power site because we obviously had reactors that we had to um, that had we brought the opportunity to refurbish and bring back to service. The other twenty percent actually came from from the units uh, in your backyard there in Durham Region between. Uh, uh, Darlington and, and, and Pickering. So, you know, the overwhelming majority of energy needed to phase out the use of coal uh, came from, from from nuclear. And so, so I think, you know, what, what's really happened here, Aaron, is we've gone from an environment where everybody was really proud of that uh, achievement of phasing coal out to a lot of people around the world saying, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. And the, as I said before, the facts uh, speak for themselves. You know, I, uh, I really like your question on public acceptance, and let me even really call it um, sort of, you know, cross party lines, cross ideologies, cross geographies. Um, and, and I think there is a, a shift in nuclear power. But one, one of the things that's really interesting for, for me, and you would have a perspective on this, I'd, I'd love to hear, but, you know, there's sort of this myth out there, in particular in certain corners of Ontario, that the production of electricity from nuclear isn't popular. You know, and I, I've worked at Bruce Power nearly 20 years, and, and in the last 10 years, every single month, we have carried out public opinion polling that says, what is the support for existing assets operating? And consistently, all over a 10-year period, 8 out of 10 Ontarians have said they support the use of nuclear power in Ontario. And you have more experience with polls than I do, Aaron, but, you know, there are not many issues out there that 8 out of 10 people agree on. Those are people, whether they, they you know, have different partisan affiliations, different geographies, different incomes, different levels of education, men, women, you name it. And so for me, you know, I, you know I'll do everything I can to earn till we get to 100% support because I believe in this industry and I'll, I'll never give up. Um, but, 
you know, I think having the courage to, to sort of recognize that this is an eight out of 10 issue that we have support on. And it's really time to say, you know, what are we waiting for? Nine out of 10, nine and a half out of 10, 10 out of 10. There's no issues out there like that. And so, so I think moving ahead with confidence is, is really important. What's really interesting is if you go and ask people, do you, looking back at the phase out of coal in Ontario, which as you noted, reduced emissions, uh, you know, reduced impact on our healthcare system with ki kids with asthma, other health conditions. If you go and ask people, do you support the phase out of coal? Nearly, you know, 90 to 95 percent of people support that. Um, so, so there's always this disconnect between I support the phase out of coal, which is 95 percent of people, and I support the use of nuclear power, which is, which is 80 percent of people. But you know, so, and I sometimes say that sometimes when we talk in, in, in this arena, I sometimes feel like we're asked to pay for the wedding but not invited to the party. Uh, and I'm okay with that sometimes. Um, but, you know, I think we're starting to get into a world, Aaron, where not only behind the scenes do people say that nuclear is important, because I think that's always been there. I think we're starting to be proud of it. And I think we need to do more of that as Canadians. I know we're going to talk about isotopes later in a lot of our areas. You know, we shouldn't be so um, reserved in talking about these areas. Is nuclear perfect? Absolutely not. But no, new, no energy form is. And the challenge of building a supply mix that, that meets all the criteria is to say, look at all of our energy sources. What are the strengths? What are the challenges? And how do we balance that? Mm -hmm. If there was a perfect energy source that met all those, those, you know, I always say to people, if, if we could build wind turbines and solar panels and power Ontario, I can tell you, I, I'm right here at Bruce B right now, we wouldn't be splitting atoms every day. You know, if there was something easier yeah. to do, we would do it. So it's a great question, but I, I really love your perspective from a public opinion perspective, because I, you know, eight out of 10, there are not many issues like that. I, I agree with you. And this is why I, I, I find it really strange that the, the, the federal government has dragged their feet on issues like deep geological storage, you know, for the storage of, uh, of waste long term, because I found that that public acceptance is high. And at first I thought, OK, I, I live in in the Durham region, you know, we have Darlington, we have Pickering, same with your community. A lot of people work there. It's important for our local economy. So of course there's more acceptance. I've talked to folks in the oil sands about how, you know, this sector could help reduce uh, energy use uh, and uh, remote sites. I've talked about it with Inuit leaders in Canada's Arctic on how perhaps small modular reactors could help some of those communities uh, move away from uh, burning diesel to generate their electricity and they have to store two to three years worth of diesel on site because of uh, transportation challenges. The, the acceptance is there across the country, which is fascinating, yet there still tends to be political foot dragging. I wrote a piece just before Christmas because I said this sector is a one to watch for the new year um, and said one word, nuclear and tried to compare it to that graduate movie where the guy says, you need to get into plastics. I'll say one word, plastics. And there was a bit of a buzz with the, the Brookfield Cameco deal in the fall with the SMR announcement. You're, you're uh, showcasing isotope manufacturing and value added from your site. So there was a bit of a, a renaissance and I spoke about it and I reminded people, this sector is the only, really you could call industrial sector that has complete transparency on its byproducts and emissions. It's all regulated. Name one other that is able, whether it's emissions, whether it's water usage, that actually has a deeply regulated approach to, to its byproducts, to its emissions. This sector does. And what I found interesting about Bruce, you're able to operate within that highly regulated space as a private sector entity, not as a crown owned entity. Right. Talk a bit about that from the boost perspective, your origins to how you became this private sector operator and how you're able to generate a critical portion of Ontario's electricity with the highest levels of, of transparency and safety. No, it's, it's, you know, look, I'm really proud of the, the Bruce power story. I know I, gr I grew up, I grew up in a small town, just, just, um, uh, north of the Bruce Power site in, in Port Elgin, Ontario. Uh, my dad worked here and I remember the days growing up when it was very cyclical, people losing their jobs, house values. And you know, the story of, of Bruce Power, Aaron, really starts with a, a decision in the 1990s to, to shut down half the facility. And, 
as you move to the late 1990s, um, there was an asset here that, that frankly, the Ontario Hydro at the time was not interested in continuing to operate. And they, they put it out and said, you know, who thinks they can make a better go of this? And, and that really led to the formation of Bruce Power. You know, I often say, we, we sometimes talk about nuclear as a technical business. And it, of course it's technical. That's obvious, but I always look at this as we're in a people business. And so, you know, the, the, the Bruce Power was, from my perspective, a group of people from all across Canada that came together to say, we have a, an amazing can-do technology here, and how are we going to innovate and how are we going to modernize it? And we were, we were fortunate to have owners, that, that uh, a private sector ownership group, uh, uh, between Omer's pension plan represents about 600,000 uh, pensioners across this great province of Ontario, TC Energy, North American leading energy company in so many ways, and our organized labor groups, the, the Power Workers Union and the Society of United Professionals, and also 90% of employees on the site put their own hard-earned money in. And so it's a unique public-private partnership. We don't own the assets. We have the privilege of operating them as long as we continue to perform uh, as far out as 2064. We're independently regulated by the federal government. One of the things I love about Canada's energy policy and their, their sort of uh, division of constitutional responsibilities uh, when it comes to nuclear powers, our provinces make decisions on supply mix. Our federal government uh, you know, is responsible for regulating the sector. And I like that separation because we can have a policy debate at the provincial level and we can have a, um, uh, you know, ensure there's that independent regulator at the national level. Um, here's, here's how I sort of look at success in nuclear. You know, when Bruce Power was formed, I remember growing up in the community, there's a lot of debate about, well, would a private sector company put, put uh, economic interests over safety? Would the focus be right? And the truth is, for anybody that looks at the nuclear industry around the world, what you find, Aaron, is the plants that are the safest, the plants that have the best safety record, the most robust equipment, those are also the plants that are most economically competitive. Why is that? It's because we're doing the right things to a high standard every single day. And Bruce Powers lived that, and we've demonstrated that by doing the right thing from a safety perspective, managing our plant, innovation, bringing that people power to bear, you know, provides, frankly, an environment where if we're doing what we should be doing as an industry leading, excellent operator of nuclear plants, the regulatory regime should never bother us. We are always working to do better than the regulatory regime. So it is a success story and it's an example where we should not be ideological about how we tackle these issues. We need to look at what are the assets we have, what are the capabilities we bring, and not put labels on it and just find the best way forward. It's a fascinating history, James. Uh, an asset in the old Ontario Hydro days, before that was kind of uh, broken up, that was going to become a stranded asset with great potential, great capability, that is put out essentially for tender to private sector operators now is a critical part of, of Ontario's electricity mix and a critical part of the low emission uh, approach to Ontario's emission mix. And now you're bringing value added products to the site with the new isotope business. Talk for a minute about uh, this exciting new business because I do think Canadians might remember that the uh, almost, a, well, about a decade ago now right. when the research uh, uh, facility in Chalk River had to shut down its reactor that was responsible for manufacturing uh, almost 90 percent of, of some of the world's medical isotopes. It, it caused a huge sort of crisis and, and a shortage. Talk about what you're doing, how you were able to incorporate that, and, and now what value add you're bringing with, with uh, the isotope business at Bruce and your partnerships in it. Because I've, I've seen it in action. It's impressive. Right. No, it's a great it's a great question, Aaron. And I mean, if I take a step back and I think about this as Canadians, um, you know, if we look at the way the modern ways in which we diagnose and treat cancer around the world, and all of us have been been touched by cancer or are being touched by cancer now, it's a it's a it's a challenging disease, and and but we there is hope for cancer patients today that there wasn't 50 years ago. Um, and what I always say is that the, the, the energy of modern cancer diagnostic and treatment is medical iso are medical isotopes. They're, the, they're the essentially the equivalent of the electricity that, that you need to, to, to power those applications. And a lot of that came from Canada. 
Um, and, and if you go back a decade or so ago when there was a challenge with supply of medical isotopes, essentially what you had was a problem that was 30 years in the making where, you know, the, this, the, around the 1950s and 60s, all over the world, you had governments that built research capability around nuclear, nuclear broadly, and they built research reactors. And those reactors were designed to do research, to develop a lot of the things that were later commercialized. Those research reactors inadvertently, over a period of time, unintentionally, became a supply of medical isotopes. So you had research reactors that were making medical isotopes. They were never really commercialized into, into a form of that, that reliability. And so you got, you, we found ourselves in a situation, not just in Canada, but all over the world that Minister Rate, you know, she often will, will, will speak about this, where, you know, we had a shortage. We had assets that were 50 years old that could no longer supply for, for a variety of reasons. And so the supply of medical isotopes was never built on a strong infrastructure foundation. You know, one of the things I always say is if Bruce B today, the station that I'm responsible for the operations of here, we have four reactors. We have one of the four that is actually on refurbishment right now. We are not limiting the electricity supply of the province of Ontario today because we have one reactor down because we have three others that are operating. So, you know, commercial nuclear plants like like the great operating plant at Darlington in your backyard, right? They have units on refurbishment, but they're also supplying electricity. My point is the medical isotope system was never built with that redundancy. So what we've done here at Bruce Power and the credit to Darlington as well, is we've said, let's take our electricity generating assets that also have a radio uh, nuclide uh, uh, neutron source available and let's put that isotope capability into that commercial redundancy. So not only can we produce a high volume of isotopes, but we can produce it reliably. And so for me, I think what we are doing here in Canada is a game changer for isotope supply. And I, I am very, very ambitious and bullish. I chair an organization called the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council about the role that Canada can play around the world in being a, a key player in this market. You know, I don't want to rely on is Russian isotopes uh, any more than anybody else. We need to yeah. supply stability, and I think Canada can provide that. And you've also built pretty innovative First Nation partnership uh, within what you're building out in the isotope business. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I take a look back at the Bruce site when it was first constructed 50 years ago, you know, uh, and, and and this is a reality. I'm, I'm, there was no I'm consultation, not, I'm sure. There was no consultation, <laughs> no engagement. So we, you know, I always say to myself, you know, we're going to be in, we're going to be operating this site for another 50 years plus. I want the next 50 years with our Indigenous partners, the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, our Métis communities to be different than the last 50. And so we have a partnership with the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation uh, around the production of medical isotopes. They are an investor. Uh, they are an advocate, and this is a way from, from my perspective that we can fight cancer together, we can build a, 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 a trusting relationship, and we can do some good together. And I'm, I'm really proud of that, and, uh, and I think it's going to be an important relationship builder for, for the long term of what we're, we're going to do. But we're the only isotope provider that has a, a First Nations joint venture. Um, but most importantly, you know, building on that, we've also taken that out and brought international partners to the table. You know, one of the things in business that's really important is to recognize when you need to bring in other capability. And we did that here at Bruce Power. We partnered with a, a firm uh, called ITM, uh, their uh, international uh, radio pharmaceutical company, uh, Framatome Kinetrics, done a lot of work with OPG as well. Uh, and bringing those partners to the table is, is really what's key here because we need to recognize what we're strong at, what we need partnerships for. But the one thing that is consistent among it all, amongst it all is the foundation is here in Canada. And we as Canadians need to be very proud of that. And, and we need to drive it forward very aggressively because I think the world is counting on Canada for this supply. 100%. I think we need to be a lot more ambitious with respect to this sector period. Uh, I said at the outset we were the second country to have controlled nuclear fission. That was uh, part of our work with the Americans who were Canadians in the Manhattan Project. In fact, we supplied the enriched uranium to the United States in, in a lot of that project through the old El Dorado site, now Cameco in, in my other backyard, Port Hope, um, which we just spent a lot of money cleaning up their, their sort of poor approach to, uh, to uh, environmental stewardship 60 years ago with the Port Hope Area Initiative. But we have been leaders here, including with CANDU technology, uh, including with supply chain, including with generating, com including with innovative private sector operators. Is there an opportunity? We've, we've seen Cameco commit to supplying 
Ukraine with uranium for their, their generation capacity. Is there, as part of this renaissance, is Canada ambitious enough to make sure that we play a leadership role? Because the one thing, you know, the can-do technology, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the unique uh, heavy water offering that we have um, and its great safety record, probably the best in the world, really. Um, are we being ambitious enough to also be part of the global climate change uh, solution? Because while Ontario in the early 2000s took 8.8 .8 gigawatts of coal off of our grid, 1,066 gigawatts went on uh, around the world uh, in the same sort of period. So we, we were a rounding error in what we were moving. And about another 12 countries began generating electricity through coal in the period that we were winding off one province. So as much as we're doing stuff in our backyard, there's a role Canada could play from, from you know, uranium, of course, but right through to technology, servicing, supply, consulting. Maybe talk a bit about our ambition right now and about how the can-do technology fits in in the global sphere. No, absolutely, and, and look, I think it's I think it's a I think it's an important point you're, you're making, Aaron, because you know I mean, and, and one of the strengths we do have as a country is we're able to point to the fact that we did phase out coal, and so we're not just talking about doing things; we're doing it. But but to your point, we are only going to be successful if we get some of these large growing countries. I mean, you look at the growth in coal in areas like China and India, it will dwarf anything we can do here in Canada. That doesn't mean we don't need to do things here in Canada, but a global problem needs a global solution. To your point. You know, I would really look at the can-do technology as uh, as a technology, firstly, that's going to be here for a long time. It uses natural uranium. Uh, it is an inherently safe design. It served Canadians and it served countries around the world in many areas that operate can-do technology, whether it's uh, Argentina, Romania, South South Korea, very, very well. So I think there's a, there's a, there is an opportunity uh, to expand can-do. But more importantly, if I look at whether it's can-do or any other technology, you know, um, I, I don't know if this quote is true or not, but I repeat it often enough that I believe it's true. And that is, you know, Frank Stronach, I'm told, always used to have a, a saying that, do you want to have 100% of the parts in uh, in 10% of the vehicle market, or do you want to have $100 of parts in every car that, that's made across the world? And that's really how I look at our nuclear industry to some degree. We have some of the best uh, engineering, manufacturing, uh, advanced robotics here in Ontario and here in Canada. And so beyond just a, a pure Canadian technology play in terms of the reactor design, Canada's nuclear supply chain has a tremendous ability to be in India, in China, providing those, 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 those services. Because you're right, Aaron, we need those jurisdictions uh, to embrace nuclear. What we do, to your point, won't matter. I, you know, I really do want to call out Cameco, though. They're a very strategic partner for us. They, they supply all of our, our fuel. You know, saw Tim Gitzel just recently did an announcement in Ukraine. Cameco is a Canadian success story. And, you know, uh, yes, they're a private, private sector company publicly traded, but they are a real national gem mm -hmm. that I, I think can play a critical role in this, a critical role in that energy security piece. And, you know, we as Canadians need to, to align behind Cameco. You know, they've made, uh, you saw their recent um, partnership with, with Brookfield. I can tell you they're a great partner for us. You know, Cameco is a national gem, and I think Cameco brings something to the table that, very few uh, companies are able to do. So I'm very bullish on, on our role, but I'm also very bullish on, on Cameco, and they're, they're a fantastic partner for us and the entire nuclear fleet here in Canada. No, they really, they really are a leading Canadian company and leading in this sector. Uh, also the largest Indigenous employer, one of them in Western Absolutely. Canada, in their mines in, in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, and you know, presence in, in Port Hope, in, in my own backyard. No, a, a fantastic company. The, their move to supply Ukraine also will allow a lot more of the world to know about Canada and Cameco in particular, but Canada period as a stable democratic supply of, of the ingredient essentially for, for generating power. And if you're going to reestablish your supply chains given uh, what Russia is doing, the Putin regime, if you want certainty, if you want a high degree of, of ESG uh, in terms of where you're supplying your, your energy and your supply network, you've really got to look to Canada. 
And there's the potential, I think, for our supply networks and our suppliers to, to take advantage of investments around the world. You're even seeing Germany talk about revisiting their decision with respect to, to nuclear energy because they're generating electricity with coal again, and it tends to be high emission brown coal as well. So some of the poor policy decisions really based on uh, a lack of understanding of the sector are now being revisited due to energy uh, needs, climate change goals. Um, has, the, has the Brookfield Cameco deal shown that there's going to be more private sector, um, you know, generation capacity around the world? Do you see this as being a renaissance that will have a, a private sector uh, push to it? Or will this still essentially be state-owned, uh, large-scale generation projects generally owned by governments? Or do you think it's going to be a mix? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a mix, Aaron. You know, if I look at the, the private sector level of investment that we're seeing in nuclear, you know, you, you noted the, the, the chemical Brookfield deal. You look at Bruce Power, one of Canada's largest infrastructure projects. So huge amounts of private sector investment in the supply chain. But, you know, at the end of the day, given the size of the opportunity and frankly, the longevity of a nuclear asset, and the strategic nature of it. This is always going to be a combination of the, the best the private sector can bring to bear, the best the public sector can bring to bear, and most importantly, that long-term policy stability that we need. You know, when, you, when you're making a decision on nuclear, you're literally making a 50 to 100 year decision, right? And, and, and that's why that policy stability is, is, is so important. You know, one of the other things that I, and I, I did thank you for your support, and I wasn't just being polite about it, I, I truly mean it. You know, when you're in an industry like nuclear and you're dealing with and working with elected officials, whether it's uh, uh, here in Canada or around, or, or around the world, and you're talking to investors about, you know, going out and doing financing, going out and seeking investment, public policy support is really important. And not just public policy support that's written in a document, elected officials that are talking about the industry, talking about why it's so important. I can't emphasize how important that is. You know, a lot of times elected officials will, will raise me, hey, what can I do to support you? I said, well, just coming to the site like you, you've done many, many times, Aaron, you've been to Darlington, you probably know the plant better than anybody. Just that vocal support, I can't tell you how much of a difference that makes. So, so to me, yes, there's the private sector investment piece, there's the public sector engagement, but there's also us being bold as Canadians that this is a sector we're not only going to uh, recognize as needed, we're going to talk about it and we're going to be proud of it and we're not going to apologize for it because, you know, I don't want to be looking back when my, you know, my daughter is, is my age and say, wow, we missed the last 30 years and look at what we've left her with, right? We have to get this right and we have to be bold about it. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and this public talk, I think it's important. So in, in the last few minutes we have, I'm going to talk two things. First is the one I think we have to talk because if you do get people with concerns, They'll usually be, well, what, do you, what about the waste? What do you do with the waste? It, you know, oh, base load from nuclear is cost competitive, but it doesn't factor in the cost of storage and the waste, which, you know, shows that people don't understand how really the system right. works. Talk a little bit about what you do with the waste on site right now, what the larger term plans are for, for longer term storage, because I think, you know, Breaking out of these, you know, misconceptions or, or shining the light on the safe practices now, what's planned, I think is right. part of this public public discussion. No, that's right. And, and look, you know, we, we do produce a, a byproduct from our operation that needs to be safely managed. It's a, it's a powerful energy source. And if we want to extract the energy from a powerful energy source, the byproduct that comes along with that is something that needs to be managed for um, for a significant period of time. What we've demonstrated in our industry for, for decades and decades is that we can safely and reliably uh, manage that. And I can, sh I can, you know, have you, like you've come to site or anybody can come to the Bruce Power site and I can show them where every single fuel bundle that we have ever used, where it is sitting. Mm -hmm. It's numbered, we know exactly where it is. Uh, and it's a very, very small footprint. But it does need to be managed safely, and we've demonstrated we can do that. So, so firstly, the first thing I say is when you produce a byproduct, can you safely manage it? Where is it? And to me, as you said in the introduction, no other industry does that. We can show you where it is. 
Then you come to an economic discussion and say, who, how is that paid for? And a lot of people say, well, you know, your low cost for nuclear power doesn't include that. Well, it always has included that. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Bruce Power as a private sector operator, we are required through our lease agreement with the province, it's governed by the independent Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission to ensure that there is adequate funds for that that are set aside. We don't get to decide what that is, it's set for us. Mm -hmm. In the $90 per megawatt approximately that we are paid for our output today, uh, about $4 of that goes to the management of spent fuel and decommissioning. So it's fully funded. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a bank account. It's not an IOU that's set up that, that has this money set aside. And, and, you know, our argument is always, you know, we need to go through the appropriate policies and, and approaches here, but let's get this facility built. It's paid for. Yeah. The, yeah. The so what you're... Like what you're able to store everything you've you've created in terms of byproduct waste right now on site. Absolutely. But the long term plan is the deep, geolo deep geological storage, which, as you're saying, has already been factored into energy costs. So it's paid for just waiting for the regulatory process to be complete Correct. so that this can be safely stored in a geologically inactive area. Um, it's already contained within cement sort of structures. So it's almost duplicate or triplicate levels of protection for this, you know, moderate level waste. You got it. That's right. And, and you know, and, and that's not to suggest that while we're waiting for a deep geological repository, what we're doing isn't safe. Mm -hmm. It's just Canada made a decision, you know, 10, 15 years ago that it wanted to move with deep geological reposit uh, repository. Um, so no, that, that's exactly right. You know, I don't, I don't see nuclear waste as a safety challenge. We never take it for granted, but I don't see it as a safety challenge. It's not a management challenge and it's not a financial challenge and it's not a technical challenge. It's a political challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, you know, I can't weigh into that too much, but, but fundamentally, you know, I, I look at it and say, what's our end of the bargain. We're managing it safely. We know where it is and we're fully paying for it. Uh, you know, not to sound arrogant, but you know, I think yeah. we're doing our bit here uh, by any reasonable measure. And so we also need to be more bullish talking about that. I, I will never apologize for how we manage waste. I, I think we do an effective job of it. Yeah, no, listen, I, I can talk the political side of it and, and urge the, the Liberals to move forward on the deep, deep geological site. Um, there, there's a willing community and I think there can really be some innovative First Nation partnerships and, and uh, opportunities for it as well. So we do have a system that not only tracks audits and accounts for every byproduct, but also has a, a long-term plan for it. And even if you look at even hydro and other clean sources of, of power, there are residual aspects to those operations that probably aren't as accounted for as this sector. Um, so final topic, uh, which of course is very exciting for us down in, in Durham, the small modular reactor that OPG will be bringing in online. And, and I just talked about, to Hydro One about the transmission plans for, uh, for bringing power from that site. Um, talk a little bit about where you see SMRs right. in the future as part of nuclear writ large in our climate change and energy security plans. Obviously, it's a fraction of what you guys do at Bruce, but can it be deployed, uh, you know, with some strategic direction? Is this a business opportunity for Canada to really get in, uh, get ahead of the SMR curve? Talk uh, a little bit as we close on, on SMR, small modular reactors. Sure. Well, I mean, the first thing I'll say is what, what is, what is happening in Durham region and across Ontario and Canada to support that I think is very exciting and the tremendous leadership by Ontario Power Generation to put together the partnerships to build Canada's first SMR I think is is fantastic and and their ability to deploy that I think will really set the stage for where do we take it from there I, I'm, I'm very bullish uh, on on the role uh, that, that we're gonna see coming out of that because if we just look at the fundamental energy needs as you correctly noted Aaron uh, there's gonna be there, there's gonna be massive demands for electricity that you know, as I look at it uh, today, even if we advance everything that we can actually execute, not everything we'd want to do, I still think we're short. So, so to me, it's a, it's a hugely exciting opportunity. But more importantly, what it is, is it's sending the world a message uh, that between our refurbishments here at Bruce and Darlington, potentially refurbishments at Pickering, SMRs, 
that Canada is in the nuclear business for the long term. And with that, I don't think we should limit ourselves to any segment of that market. You know, we talked about our, our role in providing uranium, our refurbishment capability, our operating capability, um, our SMR capability, but also the can-do technology. You know, fundamentally, this is a technology Canadians invested in well before Bruce Power was around, starting back with the 1950s. And to me, I think the can-do technology can also be a strategic tool. But, you know, I think I think that the way the sector is coming together here in Ontario is quite extraordinary. You will not see any jurisdiction around the world that is refurbishing, increasing the output of their units while looking at building new. And we're doing that here in Ontario. So I think it's an exciting time and very exciting for, for, for Durham Region. And, you know, we're, we're doing what we can uh, to, to, as appropriate, to work with OPG on that. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's going to set the tone for the, for the long term, definitely. Well, thanks. It's been a fascinating discussion. I guess it must, you know, make you feel good talking about what you're passing on to, to your children and to our next generation really is is an effort to get our carbon emissions down without quali uh, sacrificing that, that quality of life. It, it must be quite something to be part of the leadership team at Canada's biggest facility in our fight to reduce emissions. You know, if Bruce wasn't there, Ontario would still be relying on coal. We would have much higher emissions. Um, are you guys recognized for that type of, of, of leadership, do you think? Or is this something the sector is really only getting credit for now? You know what? I, 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 um, it amazes me when I go to other you know, uh, areas of Ontario, and you travel a lot more than I do, Aaron, around Ontario and Canada, but the number of people that, that recognize what, what we do, uh, whether it's in medical isotopes, energy production, that always brings a smile to your face. What I'll say is I've always believed that the... The, 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 the things that make the biggest long-term difference to Canada and the world, they're always the most difficult too. And so, you know, I always say when I come to work and, you know, we all have our challenging days every once in a while and you say, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And, you know, what we're doing is it's, it's big, it's important and it's meaningful. And so, yeah, I am proud. I know all the people here at Bruce Power are, um, but more importantly, um, I think we're showing people what, what the fight against climate change looks like and what, what that looks like. And I think we need more of that, not less of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I hope there'll be one day where maybe my daughter's working, uh, at a nuclear plant and I'm able to, you know, share the story of, of what this nuclear renaissance looked like. And maybe she'll even watch this podcast, Aaron. <laughs> and you'll say, back in I, my day, I remember when the first isotopes rolled out of there the reactor <laughs> under my watch. <laughs> and I no, may listen. exaggerate the story a little bit. It'll get better every year between now and when that story is told. Yeah, that's, that's like all stories. They, they really get better with time. Well, James Gagnac, thank you very much for a great discussion on, on this important technology. Thanks to all the workers uh, at the Bruce, much like those uh, in Darlington, Pickering. I think we can be, really be proud of of our energy workers and the fact that throughout the pandemic some of the yep. most innovative uh, on-site health practices in terms of distancing masks you didn't wait for uh, plans to roll out you really innovated and made sure you were able to keep the lights on literally and uh, and protect your workers at the same time so a big shout out thank you for the really interesting discussion on this topic and the hope is that not only will this renaissance extend to this industry, I think Canada, Canada and Canadian leadership can really benefit from a decarbonized economy through smart, strategic nuclear power. And Bruce and leaders like yourself will be a part of that. So thanks, James, for blue skying it with me today. Thanks, Aaron. Much appreciated.